Good morning. Welcome to Woodland United Methodist Church. It's wonderful to be in the house of God, to be gathered as the people of God, to experience the holiness of God as Christ himself comes to us to lift us up and to prepare us for whatever lies ahead as we celebrate with him this morning. And now as we prepare for this time of worship, let's take a moment and listen to our Woodland Weekly Updates. Hey, this is what's happening for the church for the week of March 6, 2022. Next Sunday, we are excited to say that our very own Juliet Philpot will be preaching. We'd love to have you out here. Next Sunday, we'll be celebrating the end of our basketball season with our basketball banquet. We invite all players, coaches, and their families to come out to the Family Life Center at 5.30 on the 13th for our basketball banquet. Also next Sunday, the 13th, we'll be having church council at 7 p.m. in Wesley Hall. Our quilting ministry is looking for donations of toiletry items. Please reach out to Martha Woodfin for more details. We are always looking for more items for our food pantry. This is an ongoing ministry of our church we'd love for you to help out with. You can always drop off items in the pantry itself or put it in the boxes in the education hallway. Thank you. Of course, that's just a few of the things happening here at Woodland over the next couple weeks. We have scouts, circles, stretch and walk, and so much more happening. To figure out how you can become involved here at Woodland, reach out to us on our church website or come by the church office and find out. Now, let us prepare ourselves for worship as we listen to this hymn. The Old Testament reading for today comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 65, verses 1 through 5. I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask, to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation who did not call on my name. I held out my hands all day long to rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices. A people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and offering incense on bricks, who sit inside tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat swine's flesh with broth of abominable things in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. These are a smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all day long. See, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their laps their iniquities and their ancestors' iniquities together, says the Lord. Because they offered incense on the mountains and reviled me on the hills, I will measure into their laps full payment for their actions. Thus says the Lord, as the wine is found in the cluster and they say, do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it. So I will do for my servants' sake, and not destroy them all. I will bring forth descendants from Jacob and from Judah, inheritors of my mountains. My chosen shall inherit it, and my servants shall settle there. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now we come to our time of prayer, and we begin with our congregational prayer. Let us pray together. Almighty God, in a world of change, you placed eternity in our hearts. Grant us sincerity that we may persistently seek the things that endure, refusing those which perish, and that amid things vanishing and deceptive, we may see the truth steadily follow the light of faithfully and grow ever richer in that love which is the life of the people. 
Oh, gracious lords, we thank you for this moment and this time and this gathering as we thank you for your peace and your strength, as we thank you for your call, as we listen, ready to respond to your will and your desire, not our own, ready to let go of everything and follow only you, no matter where it leads us, trusting in your strength and your presence and your grace, trusting in the power and the presence, and ready, Lord, to rise up, knowing we face all things unafraid, because, lo, you go with us always, even unto the end of the world. So prepare us today to hear your voice, and respond to your God and Spirit as we go forth from here. But now as we gather in worship, Lord, take hold of us, whisper to us your personal word for each and every one of us, and let us be ready to obey, to go forth in faith, trusting fully in all that you have for us. Lord, as we thank you for what you're doing for us, we also lift up those who need a special touch upon their bodies, their minds, their spirits, let them even now notice something's happening. Let them even now feel the power of this prayer and let them be reminded of your presence in their lives, that you're whispering, guiding, inspiring, and directing every caregiver, every doctor, every nurse, every therapist, every one who comes, even the stranger with a kind word, to be sent to you, to be sent to us, and to be sent to them, that they may experience fully, Lord, all that you would have them experience of your delivering power as you work for your, through your angels and your emissaries, your missionaries, and your witnesses. And so, Lord, as we thank you for all that you're doing with them and all that you're about to do, we celebrate. And we testify, Lord, to our oneness in this prayer. For we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are the family of God, the people of God, the children of God, the very body of Christ in service and love. We testify to our oneness in you, Lord Jesus, by sharing together in the very prayer that you, Lord Jesus, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We now come to a time in our worship service where you can be a part. We come to a time of our tithes and offerings. We ask that you take time and consider how God would have you use the gifts that he has blessed you with to further his work through this church, in our community, and our greater United Methodist Church.
Let us pray. Oh God, we know that all that we have comes from you. Help us to use them as you would have us use them so that others may be blessed through the work of this church, in this community, and in our greater United Methodist Church. Help us to be generous givers, dear Lord, both of our money and of our time, that we might make a difference. We ask this through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave us all that he was, that we might know life in its fullness. Amen. And now we come to the time for the reading of our gospel. John's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogues. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is a powerful scripture about following Christ and walking with Christ and being with Christ, but it involves sacrifice. It involves finding the courage, finding the courage to stand. You understand it's hard to find courage sometimes unless you really believe in what you're standing up for. Unless you really believe in the one who calls you. If you really believe he's present, he really is really Lord and Savior and friend. You really believe that he is God Almighty in the flesh and God Almighty in the spirit. And a spirit that lives inside of us and with us and through us. Then we find courage if we believe, but if we don't really believe or if we doubt or if we slide away from that and try to trust in ourselves, then that's not courage. We're letting go. We're sliding back. We're leaving him when we do that. But the scripture says that that's what's happened then and that's what's happening today. People call themselves Christians. They say they believe, but they've watered down their faith to the point where it's just a convenience. It's just to believe in things that they believe will help them in their life in some way, something they might benefit some blessings from. But the whole time they're thinking about what's in it for me. And they're thinking about how they can use Christ or God to help them through their lives. Maybe use God to help them get what they want. Go where they want to go. Accomplish what they want to accomplish. They want a God who's going to be behind them, making sure all these things happen the way they want them to happen. But the idea of getting behind God and following Him in Christ and being all that we can be for Him, even if it involves risk, which it does. Jesus is our example. Jesus said they will persecute you if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If they hated me, they're going to hate you. Jesus was preparing them for this. Remember he told Peter, after he'd asked, do you really love me? And Peter kept saying yes. And he said, well, then feed my sheep and care for my lambs and take care of my people. Then he said to Peter, you used to just tie your belt on and go where you wanted to, but the day will come when you will be belted by someone else and they'll take you where you don't want to go, talking about how he was going to die. You see, following me involves sacrifice, he was saying. It involves even death, if necessary, to follow him in Christ. What's wrong with us today that we've lost that? Standing up for him no matter what. Not letting other people get away with being mean and, and cruel and judgmental and attacking others. Not sitting back and saying, that's not my problem. Or sitting back and saying, I don't want to get involved because then they may turn on me and they may hate me and they may not like me. And How can you follow Christ and not be willing to stand up and have courage and be ready to go forward with him? We hear stories of people having courage. Some of the people we remember, the most courageous people, were people who took a stand and in many cases lost their lives. But we remember them. 
because of their courage. The example we want to set for our family, our children, our grandchildren, our loved ones. As we hope people will look back and see the courage and not the cowardice or not the, the desire to not be involved at all. I always found it interesting when I talk to people about some of the biggest struggles the church has gone through, being inclusive and welcoming of people like women in the pulpit and, and people of color and whites all together in one convention and comp in one conference or welcoming people, Native Americans, into the church or welcoming gays and straight, welcoming immigrants, welcoming refugees who are just looking for a place to protect their families. All the struggles we've gone through all these years where we had people within the church saying, no, we don't want them, we don't want to accept them, we don't want to welcome them. And then people would keep quiet and just keep quiet. And they may even go along with those who seem to be the majority who are wanting not to do for these people. But then when the decision is made, when everything's worked out, when everybody finally is accepted, for instance, women in the pulpit, and most people have anyway, accepted the idea that a woman has a right to be a pastor as anyone else, then suddenly these people who were keeping quiet or who were supporting those who were opposing it, suddenly they're speaking up saying, oh yeah, we're for it now. Why? Because we don't have anything to lose now. And it's easy to jump on the bandwagon after the battle. It's easy to support your country after the war. It's easy to support those who grieve after the death has been over and that they are still struggling. But facing it before, being there when they needed it most, being there when people needed the most comfort and the most help, being ready to stand up for those who are the least of these, those who have no power, who can't really help you financially or help you in your business or help you in your position in the church and who won't threaten your position because you stand up with the wrong people. But to stand up for Christ means to be ready to boldly stand up with Christ and go forth in Him. That's what the scripture is trying to tell us. The people did not want to follow Christ. They preferred, they preferred people, the masses of this world, those who can benefit them. And they don't want to be attacked. This happens in the church as well. It happens in society, but it happens in the church. I've been with groups many times who sit around in groups and they talk about how wrong something is that's been happening. The discrimination, the rejection, the exclusion. And they're saying, that's just wrong. We just believe it's wrong. I can't believe that there are people in the church doing that. And then we could be gathered in a church meeting or a gathering. Any church could be like this. Any church has struggled with this. And then nothing said. And when people speak up and say, I think we shouldn't do this. Or, I think we shouldn't care for these people. I don't think they're our problem or our concern whether it's homeless or whether it's just someone who came looking for a little help, but they're different. Maybe they're poor, and you're worried that they're going to try to steal from you if they come near your church. But you have all these reasons to reject them, and people are saying why they don't want them here. And you, who sit in this little gathering and talk about how wrong that was and how you knew that wasn't what God wanted of you, and you knew it wasn't what God wanted of anyone, and you were hoping and hoping and hoping that someone else would speak up. But no one did. And then you may talk about, I can't believe nobody spoke up. Well, are you a nobody? You're a nobody if you didn't speak up. But you're somebody in Christ if you stand up and you say, that's wrong. That's wrong. I remember um, Bessie Parker, hearing the story about Bessie Parker the first female pastor in the, United, in the South Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. She was at a meeting, uh, like a board meeting, I guess church council meeting, and there was a man in the meeting who was speaking words that were not right about someone else and directing that very angrily and prejudicially and disrespectfully. When he stopped talking, everyone was quiet. No one spoke up. And then Bessie just looked at him. And she said, John, 
you know that's wrong. John, you know that's wrong. That's not Christ speaking through you. And it's according to the story, the man, John, lowered his head and just said, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. She had to bring him under conviction. It may not have worked. He may have got angry. He may have said, who are you to tell me what I should be doing? We don't need you as our pastor. I'm going to work hard to get you out of here because how dare you not just accept this, what I've said, or just keep quiet if you don't like it. Because he was a leader. He had been used to pushing his way around. But just those words, you know, you know this isn't right, changed everything. It took courage. It took courage to speak out. Yet I've seen the other side. I've seen someone get dismissed. A, a, a family member of mine was in this particular church where a, a leader of the church, a, a children's leader of the church, had been dismissed by the Pastor Parish Relations Committee at the time. And in that church, for some reason, they decided that PPRC had no responsibility to the church. And so they, when people asked them why, they loved the, the, youth, the children leader and they didn't understand why. And they were told it wasn't any of their business. They didn't have to talk to them about why the person was let go. And the person who was let go didn't even know why. <laughs> they didn't tell her why. So she went to the pastor and she said, look, I don't understand. I don't know what I did. I don't know why it is that suddenly I've been let go. And the pastor's response was, why don't you just leave? You're gonna, you're, I haven't been here that long. You're going to get me in trouble. You're going to get people mad at me. Why don't you just leave? Instead of, I'll find out. I'll find out what happened. You have the right to know what happened and why. This has been decided. And I will check to make sure that it was legitimate, that it was right, that they did, or they had a justified reason for doing this. Of course, he's on the PPRC. He should have known, but I understand from the meeting that what it really was about from someone who was not the meeting was the fact that this person had disciplined one of the members' child, not physically punished or anything, but took him out of a game because of the way he was acting. He said, you can't play in the game because he was disrupting the whole game the whole time unless you straighten up. So she took him out of the game. And he got upset and went and told his grandmother. And she started a plan then to get rid of her and came to the meeting and pushed and pushed and talked to a lot of people before the meeting and made it look like she just was a lousy leader. She even sent a survey out asking people what they would like to see in the church more in this children's program. And people wrote some ideas and then she came to the meeting saying people are not happy with our leader. They don't think she's doing a lot of things she should be doing. And people got angry because that wasn't what they were saying. They thought they just wanted some ideas. They didn't know they were going to be judging her who they liked and believed in and who loved her kids. But this kind of thing happens all the time because people don't speak up. People don't stand up to the bullies, to the bullies who want to push their own agenda. But what about Christ? I ask people all the time, what did Jesus say to you when you thought about this or talked about this, when you decided this is the position you wanted to take? What did Jesus say to you? Don't tell me you got a Bible verse that you're using. Somehow that justifies it because people, the Pharisees used Bible verses to attack Jesus. You know, it says in the Bible not do any kind of work on the Sabbath. And he was healing people on the Sabbath, not to do any kind of work in the Sabbath. And Jesus let his disciples pick grain to eat on the Sabbath. It says you should never, ever touch an unclean person, someone who's sick, or someone who is outside of their beliefs. And Jesus was always touching people, including the sick, as he touched them and delivered them. It says that certain things, that Elijah the prophet will come back first. Actually, Elijah the prophet will come back first. That's in the Bible. So Jesus cannot be the Messiah. And then Jesus says, well, he has come. He's come spiritually. Oh, how liberal a statement was that. Spiritually, the Bible says Elijah himself. And to this day, a lot of Jewish people are waiting for Elijah himself to come. But he said that. He also said it's not what goes into your mouth that corrupts you, it's what comes out. And people grab the Bible and say, wait a minute, the Bible says very clearly, you eat pork, you eat this, you eat that, or you touch a dead body, you're unclean. 
it does affect you. It does make you unclean. And Jesus said, no. It's what comes out of you that makes you unclean. It's what comes out of your mouth, what you say, how you treat people. That's what makes you unclean. So you can read the Bible from cover to cover and you'll never be clean if what comes out of you is not Christ. It's not love. It's not inclusion and unconditional love. Because conditional love is not love. So what do we do? We know this. Many of us know it. Most people know it. But that small group who doesn't go around spreading things that aren't of God and they believe you're okay with it or I'm okay with it because we don't say anything because we're more concerned about what they think than what Christ wants. Can you imagine we're going to stand before God we want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. But will we hear when those people needed you, when there were people suffering, when there were people committing suicide because of the bullying of them, because of who they are, whether they're transgender or whether they're poor, whether they're homeless, and they know that they're being told that even God doesn't want them. And you're going to stand before God, and I'm going to stand before God. And he says, but why didn't you say something? Why didn't you speak up? Why didn't you go to them and tell them how much I love them and want them and welcome them? Why didn't you notice my children who were suffering? And needed help. And he'll look at all the rest of us and say, look, it's not always their fault because they didn't do anything because the question is, did you tell them? Did you stand up to them? Did you let them know what I wanted them to do? How I wanted them to live? Are we ready to sacrifice everything for Christ no matter what? So there'll be persecution. So there'll be hate. So there will be People offended. But I want to stand for Christ. And that's why I ask. Let's get together and pray and ask Jesus what he wants. And then let's just do it, even if it's not what I personally have wanted or wanted at that time. But once I know it's what Christ wants, I'll pray that he put in my heart the same love for these people that he has for this situation, for this moment. But I ha that has happened. The more I say that, the more I don't have to ask God what he wants when it comes to love and care. Christ's love, the kind of love you only get from Christ. You see, when you love unconditionally, inclusively, as I say so often, people, some people don't like it. But when you say it over and over, you're saying, this is evidence of Christ. This is the evidence of Christ which is different and welcoming. And the world can be transformed and changed. We can go out and make disciples for Jesus Christ now because to make a disciple, you have to be one. To, be, to make a follower, you have to be one. Turn the other cheek, as Jesus said. Lend without question, Jesus said. Help people no matter what, Jesus said. And even those who despitefully use you and hurt you and attack you, love them. As Jesus said, and if someone forces you to do something like carry their pack or something for a mile, you carry it too. Show that person Jesus. Don't react. We don't, we're not supposed to react. Christians are different from everyone else if we're Christian. We don't act and we don't react. We act. So no matter what you say to me, I will love no matter what I say to you. You will love. We will listen and make sure that Christ is our only concern. And we will boldly go forth. We hear about Ukraine and what's going on in Ukraine and, and the people being asked to take a stand. 
and people are taking a stand. They're not just keeping quiet and stepping away. They're taking a stand. They're standing for him. I remember my dad, and I'll finish with this, my dad, when he um, was in a job, an executive in a company, that there were certain things that he didn't do. It just wasn't his faith and what he believed personally. For instance, he didn't drink. He wasn't, he wasn't into alcohol and drinking. He also didn't gamble. He always thought he shouldn't take something he didn't earn through work and hard work that God had blessed him with through his work. But his, the people who were over him and work, they did all those things. And so uh, he had trouble. One of his supervisors told him that he couldn't trust the man who wouldn't have a drink with him. Then they wanted him to come and play and gamble with him and cards and for money. And he wanted to somehow be there for them too, but and not offend them so much by what he was doing that he thought maybe he could play some cards with them. But he came to me first. I was just a kid. And he asked me how what I would think of him if he did that. Would it, would it hurt my belief in him? And I said, Dad, there's nothing you can do that will ever hurt my belief in him. And he was the... He was the example of who Christ is to me. But even then, when he played with them, when he lost, that was fine. But when he won, he would try to give the money back to them. And that upset them more than anything. The idea of doing that, it kind of put a light on them that they would never do something like that. Make it just a game. So he got demoted. He still was in a good position, still caring for people. Everybody at work loved him. All the people he worked for loved him because he was always there for them. When they got in trouble, I had several stories have told me in years, since the years since then, anytime I run into certain people, they just tell me the stories of when they had a problem at work, thought they might lose their job because they couldn't get it right. He worked extra time and everything to make sure they got it right. He helped them through so much. And I am proud to testify that I don't know if I would be who I am today if it wasn't for him taking a stand for Christ and what he believed in and what mattered to him and who he was, not changing who he was for anyone. He wasn't saying people get drink. He'd been around people who drank. He was saying, that's not who I am. And you have to accept me as I am because this is who I am in Christ. I'll never forget that. And so now I take a stand for people who are hurting and people who are lost and people who are being rejected and people who are hurting themselves because they believe God doesn't love them and want them and accept them because some religious person told them that. Not a Christian, but some religious person told them that. Not a disciple of Christ. So let's remember this today. In the Old Testament scripture, we had the same, I mean, in the New Testament scripture, we had the same experience of God in that. In the Old Testament scripture, it's Isaiah 65, 1 through 5. I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask, to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that did not call on me, I held up my hand all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices, people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and offering incense on bricks, who sit inside tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat swine's flesh with wrath of abominable things in their vessels, who say, keep to yourself, do not come near me, for I am too holy for you. Who believe so much in themselves that they'll reject everyone else. But now we believe in Christ and know that as Paul said, all our sinners have fallen short of the glory of God. No one is righteous. We are one in that. And in Christ, there is love. There is joy and there is inclusion and unconditional love. And there is the testimony that Jesus Christ 
is Lord of all. That God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not, not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not the son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And we're saved when we become the love of Jesus to the world. Let's go forth in new life. Let's take the risks that may involve suffering and pain and heartache, rejection, exclusion. People may shun us. But remember this. We can't shun anyone unless we first shun Christ. Because everything we are in Christ comes from his love for all. Let's go forth in the name of Jesus. Amen.